بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Uh, continuing with the journey through some of the selections of the du'as and the dhikr found in the amazing book, um, Hasnul Muslim. We've got to the du'a, ever so important, which is what we say after having made wudu. So the author, he gives it the title, he says, Adhikru ba'd al-faragh min al-wudu. The remembrance that you say once you have finished from making wudu. And it's as follows. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. A sharh, the explanation. Awalan laftul hadith. Firstly, we look at the wording of the hadith. So this narration is by uh, an Uqba ibn Amr. It's narrated by the companion Uqba ibn Amr radiyallahu anhu. Qal kanat alayna riayatul ibn. He said, I used to be responsible for taking out the camels to the pastures. فَجَاءَتْ نَوْبَتِي فَرَوَحْتُهَا بِعَشِيِّ So one time, I came back with them in the evening. فَأَدْرَكْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ قَائِمًا يُحَدِّثُ النَّاسِ I met the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. I came across the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he was standing talking to the people. فَأَدْرَكْتُ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يَتَّوَضَّعُ فَيُحْسَنُ وَضُوءَهُ There is no Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, I came upon the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, there is no Muslim that makes wudu and he or she perfects their wudu. ثُمَّ يَقُولُ فَيُسَلِّ رَقَعَتَيْنِ ثُمَّ يَقُومُ فَيُسَلِّ رَقَعَتَيْنِ And then after having perfected their wudu, they get up and they pray two rak'ah. مُقْبِلٌ عَلَيْهِمَا بِقَلْبِهِ وَوَجْهِ and in these two units of prayer, they are focused entirely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their hearts and their minds. Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, due to those two rak'ah, after having performed a perfect wudu, would enter them into Jannah. Jannah would become obligatory for them. So this companion, Uqba ibn Amr, after hearing this, he said, Qultu ma ajwada hadihi. He said, how amazing and how beautiful this speech is. فَإِذَا قَائِلٌ بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ يَقُولُ So if they, then, once he had said that, there was somebody who said to him the following words. أَلَّتِي قَبْلَهَا أَجْوَدْ That which you missed, that which was before what you heard, was even greater. فَنَذَرْتُ فَإِذَا عُمَرْ So I looked around and it was Umar رضي الله عنه. إِنِّي قَدْ رَأَيْتُكَ جِئْتَ آنِفًا Umar said to this companion, I saw you just turn up now. قال and the Prophet ﷺ said before you came, مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَتَّوَضَّعُ فَيَبْلِغُ أَوْ فَيُسْبِغُ So there's nobody from amongst you, meaning the Muslims, who stands and makes wudu and then perfects this wudu. ثُمَّ يَقُولُ And then they say, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا فُتِحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةَ الثَّمَانِيَ يَدْخُلُوا مِنْ أَيِّهَا شَاءَ So no person makes wudu from the believers. And they perfect their wudu, and then they say this dua that we're taking today: "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu." That I bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his slave and messenger. Then this person gets the amazing reward. So the hadith, before we move on, it has two major points uh, in this long hadith. The first of them, the part that the companion caught by himself, was that if you make your wudu and you perfect it and then you pray two rak'ah you pray two units of prayer and your heart is focused on those units of prayer meaning that you're focusing solely on Allah you're not thinking about the pizza in the oven you're not thinking about you know the money that's about to be transferred into your account or anything of that nature you're solely focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then due to that perfect wudu and due to those two units of prayer that you make you will enter into Jannah inshallah of course this means if somebody's continual upon that in their lives and then the second part of the hadith Umar radiallahu anhu, the great companion, he said what you missed before that was even more amazing. And that was that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever perfects their wudu, and then they say this dua, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, that they do this, then all of the gates of Jannah will be open for this person, all eight gates, and they will enter through any gate that they wish to do so. طيب, let's go on and take some benefits. Thanyan, sharh mufradat al hadith. Okay, explanation of the uh, words of the hadith, some of the words in the hadith. So the first word in the dua is ashhad, eyewitness, right? That's how we normally translate it, I bear witness. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, I bear witness. 
The ulama, they say, أقر واعترف قولا باللسان It means that I give witness and I give acceptance to it and submission to it with the statement of the tongue, which is when you verbalize it. You say, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله واعتقاد بالجنان And then you also have deep conviction of what you are saying based upon knowledge in your heart. And you act upon that deep conviction of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone upon your limbs. So all of this is contained in the meaning of Ashad, I bear witness. So when you bear witness to something, you have to have full knowledge of what you are bearing witness to. You have to believe in the fact of what you saw, right? And seeing here is not a literal seeing, rather it's a seeing of knowledge and a seeing of the heart. We see Allah through knowledge and through the heart, okay? And then we complete that with actions uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to do so. So that's the meaning of ashhad, the meaning of eyewitness, ashhad. And the next statement, and la ilaha illallah, that there is none to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is nafi al-uluhiya and ghayrihi, that this is taken away any possibility of there being another God, creator, sustainer, provider, protector besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is nafi al-uluhiya and ghayrihi thumma athbataha lahu wahdahu fala ma'bud bihaq illahu. So this is denying that there can be anyone worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in truth. So there's none to be worshipped in truth. Why do you say in truth and in reality? Because there are many gods that are taken besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people take take their own desires as a god. Some people take money as a god. Some people, they take rich and famous people, personalities as gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Others, they have statues or they worship the prophets and the angels, etc. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us that لا معبود بحق إلا الله There is none to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next statement, وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ So after you say Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, you say wahdahu la sharika lahu. And this is like a further emphasis on the statement that we just said, on saying la ilaha illallah, that there's none to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you go on and you say wahdahu la sharika lahu, you're saying that he is alone and the, that he has absolutely no partner with him in that which is specific to him, in that which is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nobody that sustains. Belong uh, besides Allah, there's nobody that sh- shares Allah's powers, there's nobody that shares Allah's attributes, etc. etc. He is the owner of all that exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith al Qudsi in Sahih Muslim, Anna shurakai anil shirk. I am the greatest and richest of all. I have no need for any partners. Allah has no need for any partners. There's none that shares with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. من عمل عملا أشرك فيه ما يغيري تركته وشركه. and the hadith continues that whoever does an action associating into the action other than me, then I will reject that person and I will reject that action. why? as mentioned in the hadith because Allah is fully rich, fully independent. He has no need of anybody else and none can share with him in that which is specific to Allah as well. so the meaning of وحده لا شريك له is a further emphasis. Of what we mentioned, La ilaha illallah. And then the statement, Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. And I give witness and testify and accept and acknowledge based upon knowledge and based upon conviction that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's abd, Allah's servant, and his rasul, his messenger. Qawluhu rasuluhu. Ay alladhi arsalahu allahu bil huda wa dini al haq li yudhirahu ala dini kulli. When we say that we believe in the Messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu it means that we believe in the one that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent with the guidance and the complete religion, the perfect religion, to become superior over all other ways of life. Okay? The youth here ala dini kullihi. Wa huwa Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi lil jinn wal ins. And he's the messenger not only to the human beings, but he's also the messenger to the jinn, the other creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. لا نبي بعده. There is no prophet that will come after Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. So some points pertaining to أشهد أن محمد رسول الله. Points pertaining to I bear witness that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is the last and final messenger and slave of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. The first of them طاعته فيما أمر. That for you to truly 
qualify this statement that you are saying you must have ta'atuhu fi ma'amr that you obey the Prophet ﷺ in that which he has commanded. So you cannot be saying like, there's no need for me to grow the beard for men. There's no need for me as a man to pray in the masjid. There's no need for me as a woman to wear the hijab, though the Prophet ﷺ commanded all of these things. How can you truly testify that Muhammad ﷺ is your guide and your messenger, and you believe that he was sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the last and final messenger to guide you away from the hellfire and to guide you to Jannah, yet you're not being obedient to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ta'atuhu fi ma'amr, obeying him, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that which he commanded. Wa tasdiquhu fi ma'akhbar, and to believe in everything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated to us, which we find in the Quran or the authentic ahadith. So when a narration comes to you from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you know it to be authentic, you have to accept it. You cannot have doubt in it. You cannot say, well, that was for a particular time. That was for the time of the early Arabs, etc. As some foolish people say, now we're living in modern times. We have to have a different guidance. No, whatever the Prophet ﷺ has told us about the unseen world or the seen world with regards to prohibitions and commands, etc. We believe in everything that the Prophet ﷺ said. The third thing is to avoid everything that the Prophet ﷺ told us to avoid. And the fourth thing, Allah ya'bud Allah. Allah yu'bad Allahu illa bima shara'a Not to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except through the guidance that the Prophet ﷺ gave us. You cannot make up an act of worship. You cannot say today, okay, I feel like praying, my iman is high, so I'm going to pray Fajr three raka'at instead of two raka'at. You can't do that. Why? Because ibadah, worship, is what we call tawqifiya. It stops. You cannot move unless you're given permission in worship by Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. On be from the Prophet on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when people they say, for example, that you know we feel that we really should love the Prophet more, and due to that love we want to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, make it a festival like the Christians have for Jesus, peace be upon him. Make it a festival so big that we're gonna be super attached to the Prophet. They come with these ideas from their own minds. None of this is valid. If it's not found upon the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ, as understood by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of implementation, then we reject it. We cannot do it. So Muhammad ﷺ, linguistically the name, this beautiful name Muhammad, when we say Ashhadu anna Muhammad, who is Muhammad? What does it mean? Muhammad means the one who is praised. And that is the reality of the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Muhammad ﷺ is praised, as Allah says in Surah Al-Qalam, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ and you, O Muhammad وسلم, are, on a, are for, for sure and certainly on a high level of good character. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises him. And he says also in the same surah, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَك In Surah Al-Sharh, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَك We have raised for you, O Muhammad وسلم, your remembrance. Okay, So Muhammad وسلم, is praised both in terms of his being, of having an amazing character, and the most perfect of human beings that ever lived. And also in the sense, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ That we have raised for you your remembrance. So wherever you are in the world, you will find five times a day that, Allah, that when Allah's name is mentioned in the call to prayer, and also in the prayer itself, also Muhammad وسلم, his name is mentioned. So with all the geographical locations to the different time zones, five times a day in each time zone, how many times is that in the world? So many different times the name of the Prophet ﷺ is being mentioned. So he is the one who is truly praised. And when we uh, talk about Muhammad ﷺ, we have to remind ourselves that we should love the Prophet ﷺ, but we shouldn't be from those, as mentioned in passing, that we make this love up in the wrong ways, that we start to... Uh, praise the Prophet ﷺ in extreme poetry. So there's people that praise the Prophet ﷺ in poetry and within that poetry you find that there are meanings which are not befitting to be given to the Prophet ﷺ. It's as though they are giving the Prophet ﷺ attributes which belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at times shaitan he will come to people and he will misguide them out of their so-called love for the Prophet ﷺ. Rather true love of the Prophet ﷺ is to obey the messengers, to get to know him through his life, to get to know his teachings and to love his teachings, obey his teachings and to spread his teachings. So we said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan 
abduhu wa rasuluhu and the word abd meaning the slave of Allah azawajal so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ay alladhi haqqaqa al-ubudiyya ala akmil al-wujuh wa jahada fi da'wat an-nas ilayha that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he established this um this maqam this um this level which is known as of ubudiyya of servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most complete and perfect sense so there's nobody closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of submission to Allah azawajal more than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that's why this term abd okay it's something for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and for the believers which is a a term which is a term of honoring okay when we are slaves we're not slaves like slaves to anything in the world we are slaves to the creator the most perfect the one most deserving of us being slaves to him and when we attach ourselves to Allah azza wa jalla as being slaves it means that we have turned away from being slaves to materialistic matters or being slaves to personalities or being slaves to false gods so it's a really high status that we are putting ourselves upon and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he reached the highest level of ubudiyah okay in terms of haqqaq al ubudiyah ala akmil al wujuh that he completed it this servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best of ways then it's a term of honor okay so abduhu meaning the slave of the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laysa shay'un ashraf min al ubudiyah wa la ism atam lil mu'min min wasf bil ubudiyah as i just mentioned that there's nothing which is more complete in terms of describing uh, this the the relationship that a believer has with Allah azza wa jalla in terms of servitude that we are true slaves to Allah azza wa jalla we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we fulfill the commands of Allah azza wa jalla out of love and out of awe so millions of people sadly they they have been misguided by exaggerating the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you find many of them they call upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instead of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly they believe some of them that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is able to visit them in their masajid instead of being in his grave they believe some of them that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you call upon him he will answer your needs so all of these are things which the people have gone to extreme with with regards to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and none of this is befitting because it's following the ways of the christians and the other misguided sects and religions that came before them the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said clearly in the hadith in sahih bukhari and people should listen to this they should note it understand it and teach it to those that have gone astray if they are able to do so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said la tatruni kama atrat an-nasara ibn maryam inna ma'ana 'abdun faqulu abdullah wa rasuluhu the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and the hadith in bukhari la tatruni don't go to the extremes with regards to me kama atrat an-nasara ibn maryam like the christians went to extreme with isa the son of mary okay rather i am abd i am a slave i mean servitude to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone uh abdullah so say to me abdullah wa rasulu say to me that i am the slave of allah and his messenger this is how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded the believers to describe him yes he's the best of all creation yes he's the one we love the most out of all creation yes he's the closest to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he's not sharing in any way shape or form any of the rights that belong to Allah azza wa jalla any of the attributes that belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the Quran in surah al-jin Allah azza wa jalla mentions wa anna al-masajid lillahi fala tad'u ma'a Allah ahada in surah al-jin that know for sure that the masajid the places of worship and also the limbs that you use for worship belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone so do not call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this you'll find in surah al-jin verse 18 and also in the same surah Allah azza wa jal says or that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is commanded to say qul inna ma ad'u rabbi wa la ushriku bihi ahada say to them o oh muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that certainly i only call upon my lord i do not associate anybody with him so if this is the case that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is calling only upon Allah azza wa jal then we also have to do the same and also in the same surah verse 21 qul inni la amliku lakum darran wa la rashada say o oh muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to them clarify to them make it clear that i do not i do not have in my possession in my control 
any benefit for you or any harm for you any guidance for you or any harm for you meaning that this is only with the permission of Allah okay Imam Sa'di he says pertaining to this verse فَإِنِّي عَبْدٌ لَيْسَ لِي مِنَ الْأَمَرْ وَلَا مِنَ التَّصَرُّفْ شَيْءٍ Verily and certainly I am a slave I am, a, I am in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I don't have anything to do with the command or the affairs of the universe this all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so why did I go into this aspect in detail pertaining to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is because sadly people have gone astray in this issue and we need to rectify ourselves and rectify others with love and compassion and bring them back to the correct understanding of what it means when we say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu which is the dua that we are taking today you say it after wudu ma yustafadu min al hadith what do we benefit from the hadith firstly hirsu sahaba ala mulazamati rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam wa tafrigh al waqt li dhalik the we benefit how eager the companions were. Look at this companion who's narrating the hadith, Uqba ibn Amir radiallahu anhu. He had a hard day taking out the camels out to the pasture and staying with them. Yet as soon as he was free from that, he rushed to try and find the Prophet sallallahu to listen to some of the words of the Prophet sallallahu So the Sahaba, they were always keen, the companions, they were keen to be around the Prophet sallallahu because they wanted to benefit from the guidance that the Prophet sallallahu had brought with. So we ask Allah and we hope that we are also getting some of that reward because what are we doing now? We're trying to free ourselves up so that we can be with the Prophet so that we can learn from his words and that we can learn from his guidance. So we hope that we also get some of that reward. Third, th uh, secondly, That when a person completes their wudu in the best of manners and then they pray two raka'ah after wudu, focusing only on Allah جل, having tranquility of the heart and submission of the limbs, then this is like a guarantee for them that they will enter into Jannah. Not if they just do it once, but if they do this continually in their lives, they strive to do it continually. Quick question to yourselves, if anybody wants to answer, which companion was famously known for, have, for praying two rak'ah after wudu? Which companion was famously known? It was Bilal radiallahu anhu, the great companion Bilal radiallahu anhu, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said, uh, "What is it, Bilal, that you are doing? Because verily I hear your footsteps in Jannah." So Bilal radiallahu anhu said, "I cannot think of anything much that I do except that every time I make wudu, after doing the wudu, I pray two units of prayer." طيب, also we take from this benefit in the hadith that we are taking. فضل هذا الذكر بعد الوضوء الكمال وأنه سبب لدخول الجنة من أي باب من أبوابها ثمانية. We take from it. That this dhikr that you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, that this is a key to the gates of Jannah. Because the Prophet said in the hadith that we are taking, uh, that whoever said it, uh, then the eight gates of Jannah will be open for that person and they can fayadkhulu min ayyha sha. Then the Prophet, then the person enters whatever gates they wish to do so. Um, and also we take point number six, a sawab wal masnoon qawlu hadha dhikr maratan wahida khilaf liman qala bi qawlihi thalath marat li'anna al-hadith al-wari fi thalath da'if jiddan that this dhikr that we are mentioning is only supposed to be said once after making the wudu you do not say it three times as some people do why? because the hadith which mentions three times is extremely weak in its authenticity as mentioned by the great Imam, Imam al-Nawawi and Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon them both. Um, some people, they look up to the sky when making this dhikr. Okay, when they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu, they do it while it's looking up to the sky. Okay, Shaykh Salih al-Usaymi, may Allah preserve him, he said that this dhikr, if you do this, it's jaiz, it's permissible, but not matloob, but it's not sought for you to do it. You shouldn't do it. But if you went and did it, it's okay. There's nothing major on you. But you shouldn't do it. Why? Because it's permissible in the sense that the Prophet ﷺ, in many times when he would make dua, he would raise his finger and look up to the sky. Or he would look up to the sky when making dua in many different situations. But it's not matloob, it's not sought from us to do this, I'm saying, or the Shaykh is telling us. Why? Because it's not authentically reported that in this situation, 
that you do it. But a person may be confused that hang about in all the other situations, so many others, the Prophet ﷺ will look up to this guy. So uh, that's why Sheikh Saleh Usaymi, Al Usaymi is mentioning, Hafizahullah, that if a person does do it, it's jaz, it's, it's, it's allowed. We won't say there's a sin upon the person, but it's not matloob, it's not something they should do, however. Tayyip, anyway, moving on to the next narration that we want to take today, uh, pertaining to what you say after wudu. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk Saying Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant Astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk Okay Awalan laftul hadith This hadith uh, Narrated by Abi Sa'id al-Khudri Radiyallahu anhu Okay That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Man tawadda'a faqal Whoever makes wudu and says After they have done the wudu Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk kutiba fi riqin then after saying this thing kutiba fi riqin then it will be written in a riq these words i'm going to explain it will be written in a riq thumma tubi'a bi tabi' then it will be sealed falam yuksar ila yawm al qiyamah and then this this um, this document so to speak, will not be opened until the Day of Judgment. And this is Laftul Nisa'i. Imam Nisa'i, the great Hadith scholar, he's the one who collected this narration. So again, the Hadith is saying from Abi Sa'id al Khudi that whoever makes wudu, the Prophet ﷺ said, and then he says these words, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. These amazing words, then it will be written in a parchment and it will be sealed and it won't be opened until the Day of Judgment. Um, this hadith was authenticated by Sheikh Al Albani, may Allah have mercy upon him, in Irwa Al Ghalil. Tayyib. Sharh Mufradat Al Hadith. Explanation of some of the vocab of the hadith. Subhanak Allahumma. When we say Subhanak Allahumma, okay? Ay, unazihuka and kulli naqs wa aib fa anta sahib al asma al husna wa sifat al ula. When you say, Subhanak Allahumma, you are making tanzeeh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we mentioned previously in lessons you are declaring that Allah is free from any deficiency okay, in his names and his attributes that all of his names and his attributes everything about Allah azawajal is perfect and lofty قال الإمام Tabari, Imam Tabari, the great scholar of Tafsir and other sciences he says tanzeehan lak we are saying that our Allah, when we say Subhanak Allahumma, we are saying that our Allah, we are declaring that you are free, our Allah, and perfect from any imperfections. Ya Rabb, mimma adafa ilayka ahlu shirk. We are, we are doing this because so many millions, if not billions of people who are polytheists in various forms, they do this to you sadly. They ascribe to you that you need to sleep. They ascribe to you that you have a wife. They ascribe to you that you have a son, etc, etc. May Allah be... Uh, Allah is truly removed. Ta'ala Allah kabira. Allah is removed from all of these things. Okay. Wahiya kalimatun radiyaha Allah li nafsi. And it is a word, it is a phrase that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased for himself when one says this. Okay. When we say subhanak Allahumma, we're saying Allah, we are declaring and we know and we admit and we happily declare that you are free from all imperfections. And then the next word, wa bihamdika. After saying Subhanak Allahumma, you say wa bihamdika. Ay, laka thana al jamil al khalis ala na'ma ika lati la tuhsa. When we say wa bihamdika, we are saying, declaring that Allah, all praise, beautiful praise, and sincere praise belongs to you. Why? Because we've mentioned before, due to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is, in, is perfect in everything about Him, so He deserves to be praised. And for the fact that momentarily in our lives, moment after moment, Allah Azza wa Jal is giving us blessings. So for each of those blessings, we need to thank and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa bihamdika, Imam Nawi rahimullah, he mentions that it also means that I thank you and recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this tasbih, this glorification that I'm making, it was only because you allowed me to do it in the first place. It was only because you gifted it to me out of guidance and ability. So this, this is why I need to thank you even more. I need to praise you even more because you allowed me to praise you in the first place. So when a person has this type of attitude in their life, which is a reality, it's not just a feel-good kind of way we should think. It's actually a reality that there is no good that we do except that Allah guided to, us to it and allowed us to do it. 
then it saves us from being arrogant. And it always reminds us that we need to be attached to Allah We need to lower our, our, our uh, souls that want to be haughty and um, known by people and praised by people. We need to control that and remember that the reality is that I have no good in me. The only good that I'm doing is because it's a gift from Allah So I should never be arrogant. I should always be thankful to Allah, continually attached to Allah so that He can enable us to do more and more. And then the person says after that, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, we got to now where you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. And we took this already. I bear witness that there's none to be worshipped or that there's none, there's no God in truth except you are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ay la ma'abud bi haq illa ant. That there's no God in truth to be worshipped except you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more we study tawheed, the more we study aqeedah, the more we study about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the Quran, the Sunnah and the statements of the scholars, the more you will have full knowledge and certainty that Allah alone is the one that deserves to be worshipped. He's the one alone that I should be attached to. And everything else is just foolish. It's just foolish misguidance. The more the certainty increases, the more your heart and soul becomes attached to Allah, the more love and awe you will have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the extent that you will become a person that you would, won't be able to contain it. This beautiful knowledge that you're receiving about Allah Azawajal, these beautiful feelings of being connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you won't be able to contain that excitement. You'll become a person who starts to call others to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is also what is required. In Surah Yusuf, Allah Azawajal says about the Prophet, Kul hadihi sabili. Say, O Muhammad, this is my path, meaning Islam. Adu ila Allah, I call upon Allah, I call people to Allah, ala basiratin, upon clear guidance and clear knowledge. Anna me and those who follow me. So if we are from followers of Muhammad sallallahu then we need to also call to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa subhanallahi wa ma ana min al and glory be to Allah, I am not from those who are ones who make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after saying Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfir uh, um, after saying the first part of the hadith uh, which was it's gone from my head. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharik. Let's go back. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. We come now to the word where you say astaghfiruka, meaning that Allah astaghfiruka from the word istighfar. Astaghfiruka atlubu minka maghfira maghfira tadunub sagiruha wa kabiraha. Fa anta ghafir al dhamb wa qabil al tawb. Oh Allah, I'm seeking from you when I say astaghfiruka that you forgive all of my sins, the, the big of them and the small of them, because you are the one that accepts tawbah. Imam al Tibi he said, Al Ghufran wal Maghfira min Allah. Forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, huwa an yasun al Abd min an yamasahu al Adab. It is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the slave due to this forgiveness that the slave is seeking with sincerity and, and feverishly seeking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the slave from any harm, any punishment. Okay? And as, as the ulama they said, لا صغيرة مع الاستمرار ولا كبيرة مع الاستغفار That there is no small sin if it is continued. The sin is not considered small if it's done continually. If it's done continually, now that's a huge situation, it becomes a big sin. And there is no big sin, meaning that a sin which cannot be forgiven, if you seek istighfar, if you make tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say astaghfiruka, we are seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we say further, atubu ilayk. Ay, a'udu ilayk nadiman ala iqtiraf al dham muqli'an anhu ghaydu musir ala al-awdati ilayhi. I, when I say atubu ilayk, it has the meaning of returning to Allah. Allah, after having done this sin, I'm seeking forgiveness from you. I want to turn away from it and I want to come back to your obedience. That is the reality of tawbah, a tawbah to nadm. Okay? A nadm tawbah, that remorsefulness is the reality of tawbah. So somebody may be saying, it's the astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, yeah, he's texting his girlfriend, she's texting her boyfriend. They're saying astaghfirullah, but they're watching a movie which has bad scenes or bad words, right? So it doesn't really make sense. You say astaghfirullah, you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the fundamental thing in that forgiveness is that you have deep remorse, that you don't want to return to the evil that you fell into. Imam Tirmidhi, he has a beautiful narration from Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu, who said, this great companion, he said, Inna al-mu'min 
يراضنوبه كأنه في أصل الجبل. That verily a believer he sees himself and his in regards to his uh, sins as though he's sitting at the bottom of a huge mountain. يخاف أن يقع عليه. Okay. He's fearful that this mountain is about to fall on top of me. So that's the feeling, tremendous, overwhelming feeling that a true believer feels when they go against the guidance of Allah Azawajal. They feel sincere remorse. وَأَمَّا الْمُنَافِقْ يَرَى ذُنُوبَهُ كَأَنَّهُ ذُبَابُ أو نعم كأنه ذباب وقع على أنفه فقال به هكذا. As for the hypocrite, he or she sees their sins as though it's just a fly that sat on their nose and they just wiped it away. Of no consequence. So that's the difference between one who has true faith and the one that doesn't have true faith. We ask Allah to give us true faith. So this narration that we were looking at, okay, where the Prophet taught us to say this after wudu, man tawadda faqal, whoever says, whoever makes the wudu and they say, then says, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha ila ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. It has these meanings. And then once the person says this, it's put into a parchment, it's written on um, some type of um, material made from leather, jild, let's say jild, skin, leather, these kind of things, right? And it's like a parchment, it's rolled up and it's sealed and it's raised up high and it's kept with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the day of judgment. Some narrations, it's mentioned that it's under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to how much Allah Azawajal honors this statement and loves this statement, okay? It's kept with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the person will benefit from it on the day of judgment, inshallah. And it's not opened, nobody's allowed to touch it until the day of judgment. I think we'll stop here.